All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name's Maria, and I am with the Special Collections and Museum Services Department and the Hispanic Resources. And so I want to welcome our guest today. She is Gina Philibert Ortega, and her presentation today is Researching Women, Community Cookbooks, and What They Tell Us About Our Ancestors. And I want to tell you a little bit about Gina before um, before I have her start, because she is an author, researcher, and instructor with diverse experience spanning genealogy, social, and women's history. She holds a master's degree in interdisciplinary studies in psychology, women's studies, and a master's degree in religion. Her published works include two books, or three books now, I think, numerous articles published in magazines online, and she has um, several blogs, Gina's Genealogy, Food Family Ephemia, and as well as the Genealogy Bank blog. And so welcome, Gina. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We're going to talk about a topic I love, so I'm excited. <laughs> and I'm going to let people know, um, and then I'm going to show them that on, on our screen, on our website, we have, we actually have um, your handouts. Oh, good. And so I'm going to show them where they can find those handouts. So if you go to our website, which is just pueblolibrary.org, and then if you click on here where we see researching female ancestors, then you get to see a picture of Gina, some information about her, some information about her earlier presentation, and then also um, th this current presentation and underneath here, I don't know if you can see it, there is her link to her handout for this program. So feel free to, to grab that. All right. So we, so hopefully everybody's got that information and we will let Gina get started. All right, let me share my screen. Uh, hold on just a second. <laughs> and we've, we've both have had a few technical difficulties today. That's why we started a little later, but I think I see it. Okay, can you see it now? I can see it and I just added it to the screen. Fabulous, okay. Cool. Now, um, can you see the next one? No, I no. just see I just see several uh, windows. Okay. All right, hold on. I know we had this problem last time, so let me see if I can figure it out before we get started. On just a second. All right, it says it's uploading the slides, so hold on just a second. Okay. Yeah. It must be one of those days. <laughs> I'm going to blame the wind. Since it's Let's windy the wind. here and it's windy at your place. Yes. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> and then the advantages is this time we've got our handout on the website. So That's right. That. Well, it says it's processing, so we'll see. Otherwise, I'll have to go back and forth. So we'll do either one. Okay. Sounds good. And the reason why I picked this presentation for you to do is because of the cookbooks, <laughs> community cookbooks. And I, I never would have thought that they were a good source for information for genealogy, but I'm excited that they are. 
they are an excellent source and uh if it ever finishes processing um i have examples oh here we go oh, maybe i think maybe it's working it. and i see slide one is it going to work i think it's working okay so yep. you can see slide two okay mm -hmm. so we'll do it this way that's fine okay <laughs> all right so you know what community cookbooks are city directories of women and they are fabulous for genealogy uh, I have this book up on the screen. It's one of my favorites, and it talks about researching women through cookbooks, not necessarily genealogy, but just historically. And it says that um, basically that, you know, women aren't in the public record a lot unless they are connected with famous men or infamous men. But it's in newspapers and journals and, you know, uh, diaries and that kind of thing and cookbooks that we find women. So I want you to think differently about genealogy and think about how women can be found in the things that they left behind not necessarily what we are accustomed to with genealogy. So we are going to specifically talk about cookbooks and community cookbooks are different than normal cookbooks. So what are they? I'm going to call them community cookbooks, but you could call them fundraising cookbooks or charity cookbooks or church cookbooks. And actually, when you're searching for them, you're going to have to use all of those terms. So keep that in mind. Now, they might also be known by a name, like for the organization, like one of the more popular community cookbooks people collect are Junior League cookbooks. And I think I put one in here, but they have been around since the 1920s. Now, the first community cookbook was in 1864. Now, if you think about what was going on in 1864, that was the American Civil War. And that's what the cookbook was for. It was to raise funds to assist Union soldiers and the women in the ladies' aid societies and so forth who were helping them with their injuries and helping their children and doing all kinds of things for them. And that was called a poetical, poetical cookbook. <laughs> and then by early 1920s, we think there were about three to 6,000 community cookbooks. Now, the problem is community cookbooks tend to be ephemeral, meaning that people tend to toss them right? Today, if you think about community cookbooks, they have a, you know, plastic comb binding a lot of times. Uh, after a while, the recipes seem dated, and so people throw them away. And so that's why we don't really know how many there have been because of that. Now, who creates community cookbooks? Well, pretty much any kind of group that needs to raise funds or wants to have kind of a souvenir of their group or their time together. So that schools, churches, membership organizations, benevolent groups, fraternal organizations, service type groups, political groups like suffrage, maybe even anti-suffrage, uh, causes people care about, occupational groups, you know, you might also see these kinds of cookbooks. Families put them together. Newspapers put them together. Although they are typically called fundraising cookbooks, they don't necessarily have to have that as a goal. So, yes, a lot of them do fundraise and raise money for a cause, but not all of them. Now, before we get into various cookbooks, I want to show you one and go into, you know, what's in a community cookbook so you can kind of get an idea about its usefulness. So we're going to try this one. It's called Charleston Receipts. Receipts is an old-fashioned word for recipe. Now, this is the title page, and as you can see, it's a Junior League cookbook, and Junior League is a benevolent organization, and it was uh, 1950, and it's in Charleston. 
Now, this is harder to see, and I apologize for that. But on the left-hand side, we have every printing. A lot of times, Junior Lee cookbooks are incredibly popular, and they'll go through large printings, like, you know, 20 or so over the years. So that's over on the left and how many they printed. On the right, they uh, tell you what printing this is. And this actually is 1979. And then we get into the recipes. And the recipes, you know, standard recipes, when we look at 20th century cookbooks, you have a title, you have some directions, you have what the ingredients are, and then who gave it to the the cookbook committee right and depending on the time period it might be mrs whatever her husband's name is or it might just be her name uh in this case that first recipe says miss so obviously it's someone who's not married now sometimes the title or the description gives a clue to some other woman and so for example this one says this is mrs a h mazix i don't know how to pronounce that uh ratifia i guess circa 1830. now sometimes that will give you a clue to a family member it might be grandma smith's for example or something like that and you can see i have two arrows one to the title but also one to the name of the woman and where she is from So here's another example, Mrs. S.J.G. Stoney's Watermelon Deluxe. So sometimes we get that kind of information, not all the time, but that's why they need to be carefully analyzed. Now, sometimes community cookbooks have rather unusual recipes, and it has to do with the place, the time period, uh, what's popular during that time period. And that can be important information because it tells us, you know, what people are eating. Now, what's different between a community cookbook and just your everyday cookbook, you know, a more popular cookbook, is that popular cookbook that's penned by a celebrity chef or a company, you know, those are recipes they're suggesting and that they've come up with. These are recipes people are actually eating, right? These are recipes that the women or men have provided that they enjoy, that they feed their family, that has been passed down. So that is important versus the regular cookbook that might not. It might just be suggestions. And so as you can see in this one, this has uh, recipes for possum and rabbit. So, you know, depending on you and how you feel about those recipes, you might be saying, ugh. Well, this tells me something about that time and place. So obviously the top one has a little more detail about shooting the possum and what have you. Uh, it's given by a woman who is identified by her husband's name, but notice in the parentheses it gives her name. So that's very valuable. So needless to say, community cookbooks have all kinds of information in them. Stuff that you would want to eat, maybe stuff you wouldn't want to eat. But we're looking at genealogy. Now, before we talk about research, I want to give you, I gave you one example, but I want to give you quite a few so you can see how they kind of evolve over time and the differences in them. And actually, this stack is community cookbooks in my collection. All, almost all of these are in my collection. Uh, you know, there's a Junior League one in there. There's one from Goodwill, from the people who work at Goodwill. Um, the top one has to do with politicians. So there's a little bit of everything. So this one is from uh, 1876, and it's called 76, a cookbook. It's from Ladies of Plymouth Church in Des Moines, Iowa. And it's their third edition. So obviously it was a nice fundraiser for them. So those older community cookbooks, because remember they start in 1864, have things not only that you would feed your family for various meals, but they also have uh, household tips, how to clean certain things, and what do you cook for the sick. 
Now, that's not something we probably think a lot about now. You know, maybe if you're sick, you go uh, crack open a can of Campbell's chicken noodle soup or something. But it used to be that women were in charge of their, you know, their families when they were ill. And they nodded, they needed to not only care for them and try to help them get better, but they had to cook for them. And so you can see that this page on the right has wine jelly. And there's three different versions. You, you need quite a bit of that. And then toast water. So wine jelly is kind of what you would expect. It's wine in a jelly, right? It's it's wine jello. Uh, and maybe after you eat it, you don't really care that you're sick. I don't know. And then there's toast water. W well, what's that? It's it's exactly what it sounds like. You take toast, you put it in water, and then you know people drink it. So these are the kind of recipes that we would expect to see in 19th century community cookbooks, that these are overall manuals. They're not like cookbooks today where we're just looking for appetizers or how to cook beef or something. These would have helped women to take care of their families in all sorts of ways. Now, the other thing that community cookbooks give us, besides the names associated with the recipe, is who is a member of that group? So this is the Donor Club from Elgin, Illinois, and it's from 1948, and it shows you who the active members are. So we get the recipes and who gave each recipe, but we also get a listing of all the active members. And some of those members might not have provided recipes. So, and some of the recipes might be provided by people who are relatives or not in the club. So this extra information, these extra names lists can be incredibly important. Now, community cookbooks are sometimes on a community level. You know, a church group, for example, or a local club. But they can also be on a nationwide level, especially if it's for a cause. So this is an example, and you can find this online absolutely free. We're going to talk about digitized book websites. This is the Suffrage Cookbook out of Pittsburgh. And you can see on the right-hand side is a list of contributors, and you can see they're from all over, Pittsburgh, New York, England, California, because these are men and women who support suffrage. And so there's women that you probably recognize. There's some politicians that you probably don't recognize anymore. But the point is, is that community cookbooks, depending on who's putting it out, may have a very small population or a much larger. And I've actually seen where even a church cookbook, somebody will invite their mother-in-law or a cousin to provide recipes and they live in another state and that information will be included. Now, the other thing that community cookbooks give us because they're a city directory of women is advertisements. So the way this worked is that women would put together these recipes for the cookbook and then sell it to raise funds if they were, if that was the goal. But in order to publish it so they can sell it, they may have accepted advertisements. And these advertisements were for, you know, businesses in their community. Some of them would have been women owned, but not all of them. But like I said, these are these are like city directories of women that include the whole community. So here's an example from a cookbook. James McCabe and Brother Funeral Directors. Now, this is right up your alley because we're genealogists, right? Because you might need to get funeral home records. If a community cookbook tells you who were the funeral homes who were in existence at that time period, you can then look, are they still in existence? Uh, and if not, where did their records go? So this can be incredibly helpful beyond just the recipes. Here's another example. And this is from a Texas cookbook. This is from Houston, Texas for Lone Star Market. Now, I know this is really difficult to see that image, but it's a butcher shop. And over on the right are the 
carcasses and uh you know one of the men posing and there in the you know center you've got the butcher and the whole kind you know the whole deal now this gives the guy's name his address and this lovely photo if you were descended from him you would want this information but it also might tell you okay what was available to my ancestor living in this time period in houston texas now this actually is my favorite cookbook and the reason is is you never know what you're going to find so a lot of people will say to me oh, this is too much work i don't want to look for cookbooks but let me tell you why this is important this is on Internet Archive, so you can look this up on Internet Archive. It is called Historic Paxton, Her Days and Her Ways from 1722 to 1913. Now, what this is, is it's two parts. It's about this Paxton church, but the second part is the recipe. So the first part is a history. You know, who was the minister? You know, what's the early history of the church? That kind of thing. one of the chapters has to do with the cemetery at the church and some of the people buried there including photographs now i think it's genius to have a cookbook with cemetery information and obviously this doesn't always happen but the point being that these are important genealogical sources that you can't overlook So let's look at some other cookbooks. Here is one that you can see features the White House, Capitol Hill, media personalities, restaurants, area hostesses in that DC area. Look at what this rolled oatmeal cookie recipe tells us. It tells us this is for, uh, let's see, Senator Roman Haruska from Virginia. Um, his wife gave the recipe, but it's a recipe from his mother. We don't get her name, but we find out that she had 11 children. So this senator is one of 11 children. And then she goes on to talk about the cookie itself. So sometimes these descriptions will give you something about the family that can help you in your research. Now, sometimes community cookbooks don't look like community cookbooks. And so this is probably the toughest part of finding them. So over on the left is the cover, and if I had it here for you and you looked at it, it probably would remind you of a Nancy Drew book from the 1970s. That's kind of, if you think about that binding, that's kind of what it is. Now, this is a series, uh, Favorite Recipes of America. So it sounds kind of tacky, right? But it is of home economic teachers throughout the United States and actually Canada as well. So this is a community cookbook of women throughout the United States and those few Canadians and what they're recommending because they're home ec teachers. And so you can see on the right, and this is why sometimes community cookbooks get a bad rap. We get the salmon lima bean casserole, which probably doesn't sound real good. Uh, that came from Canada, so we can maybe blame that. I don't know. But um, at the bottom, we have Greek fish that includes a home economic teacher from Ojai, California. So there's her name, her occupation, and her where she lives or works. We'd have to check that out. So city directory kind of stuff. Community cookbooks like that one are not all that comb binding. Some of them, you know, are stapled and all of that, but some of them are hard back binding. In fact, those early ones definitely are. Sometimes the community cookbook tells you a lot about the organization. And we saw that with the Paxton cookbook. This is an early junior league cookbook from California, and it has a whole essay about what is the junior league. And then it has the recipes. Here's one for the Grange. Now, if you don't know what the Grange is, the Grange is a fraternal order that's been around since the late 1800s. What makes them unique is that they took in women equally with men. So women held, you know, membership just as men did. They weren't part of some auxiliary. Now, the Grange is what your farmer 
family members might have been a member of or rural type uh, families. And so that's who the Grange are. They still exist today. And obviously they would have needed to raise funds just like any group. So here's one, I think it's from California. Yeah. And it's from 1971. So that's why it's got that comb binding. And you can see there's a whole section on frostings. Yeah. Now, depending on who the group is, they may add extra information. So this is a genealogy society cookbook. Okay, so you would expect to see from them some genealogy information. And we do have it. We have this recipe. It says who was submitted. But at the bottom, it says it's from her great grandmother's collection. And then she gives her name, including her maiden name, where she was born and where she died. So this is, and it's page after page of this. So in some cases, you do get this rich information. And in others, it's just a recipe and a name. And like I mentioned before, and I'm sorry this uh, didn't come out very well, um, sometimes the group is a nationwide group like La Leche League. And so this tells me that most likely women in this cookbook are mothers, right? They're in La Leche League and they believe in breastfeeding. And so there's a lot of uh, emphasis on nutrition. And I'll tell you, one time I gave a talk and a woman came, uh, did a question. Her mother was in this cookbook. So I sent her a picture of the page her mother was on. So these can be incredibly worthwhile, but they can be difficult to find. Now, sometimes these aren't necessarily fundraising cookbooks, but I'm still going to call them community cookbooks. And the reason is, is because they have a community of women. So for example, newspapers did cookbooks. This is an early one from 1905. It's the, the left side is actually a reproduction. The right is one I took of the original. But um, it is from the Los Angeles Times. So what would happen is about 1890, there were women's pages in newspapers. And these included information about things women were interested in, including recipes. And so women would write in with their recipes and newspapers would put together cookbooks. So this is, it says a thousand recipes of famous pioneer settlers. I don't know that everybody's famous in this, but it starts off with Spanish dishes, Spanish, which actually means they call it Spanish and Mexican dishes. But during this time period, recipes from Mexico would have been uh, referred to as Spanish um, and stuff that you would expect to find, you know, refried beans, for example, or rice. So lots of stuff we would expect to find. Now, not all the women providing these recipes were Hispanic, but um, you'd have to go through and, and kind of see about that. But it does give some of those recipes. We would expect to see that because Southern California has a large Hispanic population. Okay, so we've looked at a bunch of cookbooks. So the question you might be asking yourself is, Okay, so what? Well, let's talk about what is a genealogy source and what makes a source have genealogical value. Now, you know that when you think of genealogy, you think of the census, for example, or vital records. So why do those have genealogical value? Well, they include names, right? The census is every 10 years, it tells us where people are, their name, their location. So name, location, that gives us genealogical value. It has a date, right? The 1920 census, or you were born on this date. And it may, but it may not include relationships. So after 1880, for the census at least, we get what's the relationship to the head of household. On a birth certificate, you get the child's name and then their parents. So not all genealogy sources have relationship, but that might be something that we would see in a genealogy source. So for example, the census, right? Depending on the year, you've got name, you've got location, you might have an age, 
you have all that good information. City directories. So my great grandmother is in the census, but she's also in some city directories at the top. She's in those parentheses. Her husband is named, but she's just Mary in parentheses. And at the bottom, her husband is off to sea in the Navy. So it's her name, Mrs. Mary Philibert. Now, in one of them, it even includes her occupation. So that bottom example, we have her name. We have her residence address. We have a date. And then if it was the one I'm thinking about, we would have her occupation. So that's a genealogy source, right? Okay. Well, so here's a cookbook for the Slovenian Women's Union of America. It's a national cookbook, Women's Glory, the Kitchen. And you can see it has two recipes on this right-hand side. And at the bottom of that first one, pork roast with sauerkraut and dumplings, it has the woman's name, her uh, position within the Slovenian Women's Union, and her address. Isn't that what a census or a city directory has? Yes. It's exactly the same information. Now, what makes it different? Well, there aren't a lot of easy ways to find these cookbooks. They're not all online, but neither are genealogy sources. And it does take some effort to find the women in them. But these are genealogy sources. Okay, so that leads me to where are they? I have a large cookbook collection that is part of it. So some of them are in my cookbook collection, but where are there others? Well, this might be a home source for you. So you remember that genealogy home sources are things that you find in your home or a relative's home. And sometimes somebody has passed these cookbooks down through the family. So that's one place that you might find it. But you might find it in a repository like a library or an archive. Now, here's the problem. Remember how I said in the beginning that they've been kind of seen as ephemeral, they're thrown away, uh, they're not seen as important. That historically has been true. But over time, different people have been interested in community cookbooks and have started to keep collections. So, for example, in Los Angeles, California, there is the LA Public Library. It has a huge culinary collection with community cookbooks. So you do have to look around to see who has the cookbooks that you need. Now, when we go to a catalog, like a library catalog, and I'm going to show some, we want to search by location or and or we want to use terms like church cookbook, fundraising cookbook, community cookbook, or if you know the specific organization like the Junior League, then search by Junior League cookbook. So you're going to have to try a few different ways. Now, one of the reasons is, is because everybody calls them something different. The other issue is when you look in library catalogs, cookbooks used to be cataloged under the word cookery not really a word we all use but that was the library of congress subject heading for cookbooks so you may have to try a few different things in order to find what you want now what i'm going to recommend is that you search in libraries and we're going to talk about different kinds of libraries archives online auction websites digital collections and antique stores So let's talk about some digitized book websites first. Now, the first one is Hattie Trust. Now, Hattie Trust is a kind of collaboration of various libraries that they put their digitized books all together. Now, the bad thing about this is that some of the books are within uh, copyright status. And so you have to log in with a library card from one of their partners. If you have a Library of Congress card, that's great. They're one of the partners or maybe a university. But a lot of times what we're looking for are older books. And so you don't need that unless there's some restrictions on it. And you're going to use your keywords, the ones we talked about, you know, 
the type of cookbook, uh, community cookbook, church cookbook, fundraising cookbook, you know, a place, you're going to use that as you search. So here is an example, and this is uh, the Third Presbyterian Cookbook. And uh, when you find it on Hattie Trust, it allows you to page through, to search. You can save pages. Now, the problem is, is that if you don't have a login, you have to save page by page. You can't save the whole uh, book. So that does take some time. The other digitized book website that you might be interested in is uh, Internet Archive. Now, Internet Archive is things that Internet Archive has digitized, but also what other entities like libraries have digitized. And actually, they do have a cookbook collection. So the way to find that is to go to Internet Archive and where that orange open book is, click on that. Then you will see something that says additional collections. Click on that and then you can uh, browse through till you find the cookbook collection. So see how it says, it's almost like Pinterest here. It says additional collections. Now this is gonna move. So you can go today and look and it's not gonna be in the same place, but you would go and click on there and then find the cookbooks. Now that doesn't mean that that's all the cookbooks. You could just search American libraries and find some, but the cookbook collection is specific to cookbooks. Now, the other place that there is uh, digitized books is Google Books. Now, Google Books is not an active, uh, they're not actively digitizing anymore, but they do get things from partners and what they scanned is there. The beauty of, of Google Books is they do have scans of some uh, of the books that they digitize, which are things in copyright or out of copyright protection. Now, this is... OCR, optical character recognition. So that means you could insert your ancestor's name. But remember how when I was showing you some of the names, sometimes it's Mrs. whatever his name is or Mrs. with his initials or a nickname. That can make it difficult. So you need to make sure you search all of that. But you might find it beneficial to look at just a location and the location and the name in the cookbook or the church and the word cookbook. All right, so that's what's online. Let's talk about libraries now. Now, when we think about libraries, there are different kinds of libraries. There's public libraries. So we're part, we're right now at a public library. Now there's the public library where you are and where your ancestor lived. So I would try both. And remember that the public library where you are, there's things like interlibrary loan or digitized uh, collections or online databases that you can look at with your library card number. There are private libraries. And when I think of these, I think of member only libraries, maybe like DAR. They may have cookbooks. DAR actually has put out cookbooks, so that is a possibility. I don't know that they have a large culinary collection, but they do have some. Academic libraries. Now, some academic libraries do have culinary collections. Texas Women's University has a culinary collection. Harvard has a culinary collection. Uh, I think University of Michigan has a culinary collection. So that's a possibility. State libraries sometimes exist, or they are state libraries, state archives, state historical societies. They are, may or may not have uh, community cookbooks. And then there's national libraries, like Library of Congress. And they actually, I think it's on your handout, have a page of uh, links to some digitized community cookbooks that you can find. And then genealogy libraries. So you might be thinking, why would a genealogy library have cookbooks? Well, they could if they have family information. And so Family Search has a few. I think uh, when I was at Allen County Public Library, they had a few. Nobody has a, a huge collection at genealogy libraries, but they do have some. 
One place to look for libraries and library collections is WorldCat. And so this is 10,000, uh, 2 billion items and 10,000 libraries. And so you can do a search. And once again, you're going to search on the type of cookbook or the entity. You're not going to search by your ancestor's name. This is not OCR information. This is information that is cataloged according to the title, the author, the publisher, the topic, the subject. So here's an example, Methodist cookbook. Uh, not really a great search, and there's 3,000 results, but I could then narrow it down by maybe a place. And you can see it says Taylorsville United Methodist Church, Taylorsville, Smith County, Mississippi, and then, you know, what year it is, and you can go from there. Now, I looked at Pueblo City yes. County Library, <laughs> and so I did a search. I did a few searches, actually, on the catalog. And so here was an example. Now, sometimes it's difficult to see what, you know, what's going on with this cookbook. So it was just called St. Joseph Christian Women Cookbook. I looked under the term church cookbook and I had to scroll quite a bit. So this is from 1979. It's 300 pages. It's for Pueblo, Colorado. And you can see you can only use it at the library. So there are things like this. In fact, there were quite a few church cookbooks that have this kind of default image. So you have to be careful. That's where asking a librarian for help can be beneficial. Now, what about archives? You know, archives aren't the first choice I would have in looking for a cookbook. I would exhaust everything else, but there can be cookbooks at archives, especially uh, books that women put together themselves that were like manuscript books with recipes from family and friends. So they can exist. So this might be a government archive, maybe a city or county state archive. I wouldn't expect to see community cookbooks at places like National Archives, for example. There could be one at a corporate archive, but mostly what I would expect is an academic archive, an academic institution that is collecting things from their community, they're concerned about the history of their community, or they have a culinary collection. There might be also a historical society collection, whether it's on a city, a county, a state, or a topic. Museums might have cookbook collections, and maybe religious institution archives if they themselves put out and published. It would only be their cookbooks, not other places. So archive-wise, we're mostly looking at places like academic archives. One place to do a search is ArchiveGrid, and this is like WorldCat, but it's for archives. Just like WorldCat, not everybody participates. So you have to be careful. It's a keyword search not a person search, unless your person was famous, they were the author, something like that. It's not OCR content. So we would use church cookbook or a place and the word cookbook or a church and the word cookbook. So I did just use community cookbook to see what would happen. And you can see there were 440 results. Now, this is pretty general, so I'd probably want to do some more work with this. And like I said before, community cookbook isn't a term that everybody uses. So uh, let's look at that middle one from the University of Arizona. It says it's a Southwest cookbook collection from 1960 to 1980. It includes Arizona, New Mexico, and Southwestern cookbooks, uh, different culinary favorites. Uh, women's clubs, church organizations, schools, educational associations, community groups. That's what that's what I'm looking for. Now, what's different is archival our archival collections are kept in folders and boxes, that kind of thing. In fact, this says it's 11 linear feet. So that's how archival collections are measured. So that means that I would either need to see if they have a finding aid where they list what these cookbooks are, or I would need to contact them and say, hey, I'm doing research on Phoenix, Arizona. Do you have any cookbooks from there? And they would tell me, or I need to go there and do the research. Now, 
archival research is different than most of the research genealogists are used to because it's not online. So they may have the finding aid online, but they're not going to have the collection online. So it means traveling to that place. It means spending time going through the items. So either you have to do it or you have to hire someone to do it. And sometimes these archival collections end up in weird places. Now this, you know, it's in Arizona. They have Arizona and New Mexico cookbooks. That, that makes sense. But it wouldn't be unusual to find out, you know, maybe they have a cookbook collection and it's stuff from Chicago. So just because a archiving is, is in a specific place doesn't mean that everything is from that place. Now, there's also digitized collections. And one of the ones that are really the one I want to talk about is this one, DPLA, the Digital Public Library of America. This is only for U.S. collections. Uh, it's only U.S. repositories. They may have stuff outside the U.S., but it's located in the U.S. This is libraries, archives, museums that have come together and created this collaborative catalog. Now, the items on here are digitized, and there are digitized books. So it can be incredibly helpful. Now, the other thing that I like about DPLA is it allows you to create lists. Now, there's no sign-in, so you don't have to remember a password. I don't know about you, but I can never remember passwords. So it goes off your browser and you're, you are, you know, where you're going from your home. So it's only from that computer. You can't take it with you, but it's a way that you can put together a list of community cookbooks that you're interested in or whatever you find. It's a keyword search. So uh, once again, you would try, you know, uh, your various, you know, church cookbook, fundraising cookbook, or the place. It's not going to have the name of everybody who submitted a recipe because although the items are digitized, I don't believe they are OCR'd. So here's an example. So these are 49 results for a church cookbook. Now, this is going to change, right? Because people are constantly adding their collections. And you can see there's a big orange button that says create a new list. That allows me to save these on that list. And so you can see the top one is Bethabara Moravian Church Cookbook from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It's at the University of North Carolina. So these items aren't owned by DPLA. It's a collaboration. They're owned by a different entity. And so once you click on whatever you're interested in, it will take you to a page and then you click again and it will take you to whatever repositories may, you know, page for that item. But like I said, these cookbooks are digitized. Now, there are other digitized collections online. This is through Michigan State University. It's called Feeding America. And it is, they have a large community cookbook collection. This is only part of it, but it's what they've uh, digitized. And so I put up there an example, the Washington Women's Cookbook. This was a suffrage cookbook. It's kind of an interesting suffrage cookbook. It even has, I think, meals for camping and stuff. So it is, um, they took selections from their community cookbook or their cookbook collection. Some of them are just cookbooks and they digitized them and made them available. And so it tells you a little bit and then you can either view the PDF or you can go through individual images. Now, newspapers might be a place for you to find community cookbooks, their mentions, or recipes from them, or your female ancestor with a recipe she submitted to the newspaper. Now, this isn't a newspaper talk, so I'm just gonna mention Library of Congress's Chronicling America because it's free. So you can go to Chronicling America and you can search newspapers, you can search by name, but you can also, where that big pink button is that's rectangular, you can use their newspaper directory 
to find newspapers for the place your ancestor lived. Uh, they have ethnic newspapers. They have labor union newspapers. I think they even have some religious newspapers. So it's not only a site to find content, it's a site to find where newspapers are located. Now, where else can you find things online, these community cookbooks? Well, you can go to eBay. Now, I get all kinds of community cookbooks by eBay. Now, what I would suggest is if you have ever bought anything from eBay before, you have a sign-in. And you can get a sign-in without buying anything. They allow you to create alerts. So you can create an alert for the place your ancestor lived, for the group she was a member of. You can create alert for her last name. You can do all of that. And then as items are added, they will send you an email with those items. Mm -hmm. And you will get that. I think you might be able to say how often. I get mine every day. So you can do that. You can search. I just did a search for California Community Cookbooks and got all these different listings. Now, you know, it's an auction site. So some of the items like that second cookbook is $2.95. I mean, who can resist that? But some of them are really expensive. And that's just because the seller has determined that they think it's worth that. What you might want to do is continue your search. You might want to look is if free online, for example. You know, Google the name of the cookbook. You might find out that there's a free PDF for that cookbook. In fact, I'll tell you, one cookbook that I have uh, that I wanted, 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 and it, it wasn't a community cookbook. It was another one by one of my favorite cookbook authors, um, and it was published in the 50s. It was online for about $60. One day on DPLA, I found out someone had digitized it, and I downloaded the whole thing for free. <laughs> so that's why knowing about these various sources can be so important. And then obviously online bookstores. And this might be a used bookseller, uh, an individual one, or a consortium like, like Aid Books or a Libris or one of those where you might get various uh, cookbook bookstores or regular bookstores selling cookbooks. Or it might be a specific cookbook store like Omnivore in San Francisco. So that's also a way if you're looking for something very specific, like, you know, I'm looking for this Methodist cookbook in this place during this time, that might be the best way to go if you've exhausted everything else. All right. So those are ideas about community cookbooks and why you should research them. I don't know. Do you have any questions that I can answer? Well, I... I did post on the YouTube channel if they had any questions to let me know, and I'd ask you. So right now we don't have any, but All I right. do have some questions. Yeah. For you. I was wondering, um, so when you're using research for with cookbooks, were you able to find information for your own family? You know, this is the funny thing. I found information about almost everybody except my own family. Oh, and no. my great grandmother <laughs> was a cook. Oh. So I know she's got to be in one of these cookbooks. I just haven't found it yet. <laughs> so, um, you know, and unfortunately she lived in a big place. So I don't know, you know, I mean, she lived in LA for some time. Yeah. So no, I have not found, but <laughs> I will tell you when I've given this talk, I've had people contact me later and tell me that they did find their ancestor in a cookbook. Um, either online or, or wherever. So, you know, one of the problems um, I would say about this is, you know, they can be difficult to find. Oftentimes it's a matter of going page by page. So it's not like there's a database that you can quickly put in a woman's name and, oh, there's the cookbook she's in. Now, there are some women who are doing that. There's uh, a woman who she has a website called O. o <laughs> old line plate and she indexes uh maryland cookbooks wow so um she has and it's you can find it on her website and you could do a you know a look through those so i think in time hopefully we'll get more and more entities i know a library who's doing it i know a society who's doing it that will have these databases and make it easier 
Cool. cool. So another question I have is, have I mean, I see like in the United States, we have these cookbooks, but if you're researching for family abroad, um, is, is it possible to find that also? Yeah, there's community cookbooks in Canada. There's community cookbooks in England. Now, I don't know beyond that, um, but there are other places. There's also groups, you know, like American women who were uh, in Japan or Korea with their husbands who were in the military or whatever. In fact, on my slide on the left, that last cookbook on the bottom is one of those. So okay. sometimes uh, American or Canadian women who are abroad, they also create cookbooks and those can exist. But whether there is for every country, I don't know, to be honest. Yeah. So another question I had, did you find any recipes that you wanted to try when you're doing your research for? <laughs> you know, I have found some really good recipes like, you know, that I go through because I read these all the time and I think, oh, yeah, I, I would eat that, you know, you know, obviously different cakes and, and that kind of thing. But then I found uh, probably the funniest one I found, though, I don't know how funny really this is, is, you know, tastes change over time. Right. Yeah. I mean, what we what we ate when I was a kid isn't stuff we necessarily eat today in my family. And one of my older community cookbooks, it might even be that one from 1876, had a recipe for uh, turtle soup. Wow. Well, that's not something most, well, that's not something we in California typically eat. <laughs> uh, there are some places that eat it and there are some recipes, uh, some restaurants that serve it. But the recipe goes into quite a bit of detail about how to dispatch the turtle and cook it. And then because that was such a big deal in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, there had to be mock turtle soup recipes because mm -hmm. they almost fished out all the turtles. And mock turtle soup is made with a calf's head. Oh. <laughs> so there's those kind of recipes I find quite a bit of. And yeah, there are recipes that I look at and say, oh, I definitely would eat this. Um, and some are recipes that we, you know, that have stood the test of time. I think one is um, what some people know as goulash, or some people call it uh, chili mac. Some people call it American chop suey. It's basically elbow macaroni, ground beef, some sort of tomato sauce. And then depending on what you call it and where you're used to it, uh, you might have other things like onion or bell pepper or something. Wow. So I see those in cookbooks all over the United States. It's called something different depending on where you're at. In Boston, it's American chop suey. So, um, yeah, I would eat that. I've cooked that for my family. Definitely. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much, Gina. I really appreciate you presenting this with um, for the Pueblo Library today. And I know a lot of people are going to benefit from this um, presentation. So thank you. We thank do you. have we do have quite a few community cookbooks here in Pueblo. And in fact, my family's even contributed to one probably, gosh, I think it was like over 25 years ago. Oh, and, really? <laughs> and they were recipes and it's just just family recipes. And so it's kind of interesting to think now that maybe in the future somebody's gonna look at those and find some interesting information, right? They might, they might, yeah. And, and you know, look, I mean, obviously we didn't talk about this, but it also shows what you ate and gives you some background. It might even give you ethnic background on what people ate. So there's all that that we didn't get time, you know, to talk about because we we're focusing on the genealogy, but absolutely. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much. And um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And I hope you enjoy your Women's History Month. And we will see you um, again. So thank you, Gina. Have a great thank day. Thank you.